one and all. Those of you here in the sanctuary, those still coming in the front door, uh, those of you joining us downstairs, those of you joining us from home on the live stream, it's truly great to have you all as part of our Sunday worship gathering. Now, as we enter into our call to worship, let us rise together and worship our triune God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our refuge and strength. You welcome our worship. Despite our confusion, our frailty, and our many troubles, we are weak, but you are strong. And so we come to you this morning as weak people, trusting in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who died for us and now lives to make intercession for us. Accept our worship in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's worship together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the enemy. Praise Father, Son. Seems flow in heaven above and earth below. Praise God the Father and the Son. Praise God the Spirit three in one. From all God saves those who are perfect or those who can pretend that they're perfect. No, the good news of the gospel is that God came to save sinners. He came to save sinners. So he's not surprised. He's not put off by the fact that you and I have sin that we need to confess to him this morning. In fact, Jesus lives for this very purpose, to gladly and fully forgive anyone who comes to him humbly and in faith. Let that truth lead us to fully and gladly confess our sins together this morning. Will you do that with me now using the words on the screen? Oh God, we confess this morning that we have not sought you while you may be found. 
or called upon you while you are near. We have spent our money for that which is not bread and labored for that which does not satisfy. In repentance, we turn to you this morning. We humble ourselves, we incline our ears. Forgive us and heal us according to your steadfast love, which you promise to us in Jesus. Amen. Hear these words of assurance now for all who trust in Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. By the grace given to you through Christ, your sins are forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. Rest in it and be at peace. Sets the free. 
song because it points us to where our hope is, even in our darkest moments. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and in our sin and our weakness. We get to continue exploring that reality as we profess our faith together this morning using the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. Let me ask you this question. You can respond with the answer. Coram Deo, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Truly good to see so many of you here. I think this is about as many people as we've had since we've been back in the building. I just want to shake all of your hands and give you all a big hug, uh, but we can't do that, and we should, and we won't. Um, even though we can't do that, uh, we can still practice hospitality as a church. So we want to be welcoming to one another. Uh, to that end, want to encourage you to look around, see who you're worshiping next to. If there's people we haven't connected with in a while or somebody new, uh, please join us after the service. We have some space outside set aside where we can greet each other uh, from an appropriate distance. So please take advantage of that. Now, if you are newer to Coram Deo, uh, it's very important that we help you get connected, especially in a time like this where we're having to spend more time apart. So there's two opportunities I want you to take advantage of. Uh, the first is our weekly email. You can sign up on the front page of our website, cdomaha.com. If you sign up there every Monday morning, you're going to get a communication that has all the information you need to know about what's going on in our community. Uh, the other thing to do is to text the words connect me to the number on the screen, and Ryan Meyer will reach out to you sometime this week to tell you more about how to get connected to a gospel community, uh, answer any questions you may have about the church. Another way for us to stay close even while we have to be apart. Finally, a word about giving. Uh, if Coram Deo is your church, if you are a Christian, we trust that you're worshiping God with your tithes and with your offerings. One way you can do that is by giving in the box in the atrium on the way out. You can also give online uh, if you'd prefer. Uh, now we come to the time in our service where we get to pray together. So I'd ask you to just join your heart uh, with mine as I pray for the needs of our community, particularly those uh, who are suffering in this season. Um, and also at the end of this, there'll be a time for all, all of us to join together and say the Lord's Prayer in unison. So uh, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we read in Psalm 22 that you have not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Thank you for being a God that does not turn away from us in our weakness or hold his nose while he reluctantly comes to help us when we are suffering or in sin. Thank you instead for being a God who listens for our cries, who hears us when we call, and who runs towards us with forgiveness and healing and strengthening power. We do not deserve this grace, but we rejoice that it has been freely given to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus, we pray now that you would see the affliction of those among us. We know of many in our own congregation who are suffering the effects of the fall within themselves and within the world around them. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of parents and grandparents, for those dealing with health complications in their children, for those suffering through the painful fallout of broken relationships, for those struggling with addiction, for those working to overcome the complications of job losses or underemployment, for those waging a daily battle with anxiety and depression, for those of us laboring under the stress of navigating through these difficult and confusing times. We pray that all who are suffering would know that you see them, that you love them, and that your heart is for them not in spite of their pain, but because of it? Would you draw near and strengthen them with the hope of Psalm 22 that the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, that those who seek you shall actually find you and praise you? 
Holy Spirit, help us as your people to have the heart of Christ for those around us who are suffering. Help us to see them as you see them. Help us to move towards them. Help us to serve them. Forgive us for the ways that we have failed to do this. Give us opportunities to grow more into the image of your son, Jesus, who still lives to give himself to the weak and needy. Would you do those things now uh, through the reading and preaching of your word? Would you do those things now as we pray together as Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, 
that he has done it. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning, church. My name is Ted Smith, and I serve as a deacon here at Quorum Deo, and it's my honor and privilege to preach the word of God to you this morning. This morning, we continue our summer sermon series in the Psalms, and when we were looking ahead to this sermon series, I was immediately drawn to Psalm 22. You see, Psalm 22 is a personal Lament, And so I'm excited to help us think this morning about what it means to lament. I love how the Psalms give us words to lean into our pain and grief. Pain and grief are no doubt familiar themes of life, and they certainly have been for my wife and I over the past few years. And so my aim this morning is to share very personally with you as we look to where Psalm 22 leads us in the midst of our pain and grief. On May 11th of this year, my dad took his final breath. He was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer three years ago, and at that time, we just didn't think he had much time to live. Much to our surprise, He lived a quality three years following that diagnosis, and that was the case until earlier this year when the cancer spread to his brain, leading to his rapid decline. And as I sat around my dad in their house while he was on hospice care with my mom and four siblings, I felt such a deep sense of anxiety. We knew this time was coming, and he had expressed that he was, in fact, ready to go. But beyond the obvious pain of looming loss, I remember feeling such a deep angst about how to enter into this new reality. In one sense, of course I felt that way, right? I knew I was about to lose my dad, and I was flooded with countless thoughts and emotions in memories. But in another sense, what I realized in those moments is that, frankly, I just didn't want to enter into the full reality of that moment. I didn't want to face the pain of that. I didn't want to have to explain to my kids. As part of my ministry, I like to think a lot and read a lot about grief, seeking to come alongside others in their pain. And yet there I was, walking out of the room to avoid crying in front of my kids. I knew it wasn't healthy, but I was just seeking. Was there any way of avoiding the discomfort of grief and tears and sadness? The reality is I was not okay. But I wanted to act as if I was okay. I realized that my preference was to keep things neat and controlled, and I just don't always have a category for the pain of grief. And so really, I would just rather not go there. Can you see the same tendency in yourself? We would rather act as if we're doing okay when, in fact, we're not okay at all. And isn't this also true of American Christianity? We like our Christianity happy, uplifting, and positive. And the very idea of grief or lament conflicts with our happiness. I'm not sure that most of us have a healthy category for lament or grief. And certainly there might be a number of reasons why that is. But maybe it's because cultural Christianity doesn't want to talk about pain and lament. Maybe it's simply because it's uncomfortable, or maybe it's due to a lack of safety. Maybe we're overcome with shame or guilt. Maybe it's because we want to compare our grief. Maybe we just don't know how to categorize it at all. Or maybe 
Just maybe we believe that grief or crying out to God actually reveals a lack of faith. The reality is you either have, you are, or you will experience grief in your life. And Psalm 22 helps us learn to lament. If you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 22, and the words will be on the screen as well. As we think on this this morning, I want to look at three main points from Psalm 22. Number one, the invitation to lament. Second, the model of lament. And third, worship in lament. The invitation to lament, the model of lament, and worship in lament. So first off, the invitation to lament. The invitation hits us square in the face in the first couple of verses. The passage immediately gives us a drastic picture of crying out. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Psalm 22 is a prayer for help. And right away, we see David crying out to his God, asking, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far? I cry, but you do not answer. David is crying out in deep agony with deep honesty. This is a powerful invitation to God's people. I want you to see the reason this is such a powerful invitation is that we see these very words cried out by Jesus himself on the cross in all his agony. Jesus on the cross looks back and uses the words of Psalm 22. Listen as I read in the New Testament from Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema shebektani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the passion narrative of Jesus. Here we see Jesus on the cross crying out. He is not just crying out about his physical suffering here. Yes, he is in physical pain. He has been beaten and flogged and mocked and has experienced all kinds of physical suffering. But through it all, he remained calm and controlled. But here, here he starts to scream. And it tells us something. It tells us about his spiritual suffering. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, when Jesus calls out, my God, my God, you have forsaken me, what it means is that his soul is being plunged into absolute spiritual darkness. He is going down into utter spiritual destruction. There was a sense of being eternally and utterly lost. He was experiencing all the infinite sufferings of anyone who is eternally cast out of the presence of God. He was being forsaken because God abandoned him to death. He gave him up to this death at the hands of these sinful people. He could have saved him, but he did not. And that's why Jesus screams. The Son of God cries out to the Father in all his agony and distress, Where are you? Sound familiar? Do you ever feel like you just aren't sure if God hears you? Do you ever feel like you aren't sure if he even cares? Maybe you aren't sure if he is even there at all. But in calling out to God the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus completely 
and fully identifies with his people. Life hurts, doesn't it? The last two pregnancies my wife had ended in the operating room, having a DNC, following miscarriage, which is the process of removing our lifeless baby from the womb. We were looking ahead and anticipating that joyful reality of welcoming new life into our family. We instead found ourselves arriving at the hospital to confirm the loss of life. And it's an experience I can only describe as empty and lonely. Maybe that's been your experience. Maybe you haven't been able to get pregnant, yet you long for that reality. Maybe you're asking the Lord to lead you into marriage, yet that just hasn't happened and you aren't sure if it ever will. Maybe you are struggling through a child's sickness or a diagnosis of cancer or the death of a loved one. Whatever the case might be, I think it's safe to acknowledge that life just hurts. We experience hurt and pain and suffering and oftentimes feel like there's nowhere to go And we're left clinging to the hope that surely time will heal, right? Only to find that the pain and grief lingers. Psalm 22 wants to show you that God is inviting you to lament. In fact, lament is appropriate. Lament is biblical. Lament is Christian. We are free to ask why. It is safe to ask how long. We don't have to be embarrassed. We don't have to be ashamed. Instead, we need to be reminded that God is not surprised by our grief. Psalm 22 invites us to cry out, And all our pain and agony and questioning, this is the invitation from the Son of God. Now, I do want to acknowledge there is a real danger or temptation here. And sometimes we think we can say whatever we want to God or about God, and we can go to a place where we're actually casting blame on God. While while Psalm 22 invites us to lament, This passage also gives us a model of lament. And so let's look at the model of lament. Notice, first of all, that Psalm 22 is deeply personal. Look with me again at the beginning of verse 1, where it says, My God, my God. This use of my points to a continuing relationship. The use of my points to a confidence in who God is. When Jesus prays this lament on the cross, it's not an indictment. It's not a questioning of the character of who God is. Rather, his lament is rooted in exactly who God is. In the anguish of forsakenness, Jesus cries out in trust. And immediately following his complaint in verse 1 and 2, notice that David shifts to using the key word, yet. Psalm 22, verse 3 through 5. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. And then again, following this second complaint, he goes on in verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. This yet is an important part of lament. It's a way of acknowledging my experience is not 
the sum total of reality. In the, midst, in the midst of deep pain and abandonment, David is choosing to anchor his soul to the nature and character of God. You see, the point of lament isn't simply to sit in isolation and all of our sorrow and grief. Yes, we speak honestly about our pain, but we acknowledge the yet of God's character. This is the coexistence of pain and belief. Author and pastor Mark Rogop puts it this way. He says, the word yet reminds us that sorrow doesn't have to yield before we ask God for help. Part of the grace of lament is the way it invites us to pray boldly even when we are bruised badly. Part of the grace of lament is the way it invites us to pray boldly even when we are bruised badly. Psalm 22 gives us the freedom to exist in all of our hurt and pain and brokenness while calling out to a holy God. The yet reminds us of who he is and what he has done. Look at the beginning of verse 3 again. Verse 3 says, Yet you are holy. God's holiness points to his faithfulness and mercy. He is the holy or perfect sinless God. He has made a covenant or a promise with his people. David is looking back at his covenantal faithfulness, saying in verse 4, In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The Lord has proven to be a faithful God to his people. David knows this. And he looks to this reality. Notice the coexistence of pain and belief. His pain didn't subside, but he looked to the Lord's faithfulness, knowing that is his character. Toward the end of my dad's life, he had been at the hospital for a couple of days, and the difficult decision was made to bring him home on hospice care for his final few days. And as I stood on my parents' driveway and that ambulance backed in and those doors opened up and I saw my dad laying on his hospital bed, the reality hit hard. The reality of his physical decline seemingly by the day and as we began to gather around and spend those last few days with him, we longed for him to have relief from the pain we longed for healing. We longed for a miracle. But as his fate became more inevitable, my sister spoke a profound word of what's true. Saying, yes, we long for a miracle, but we know that the real miracle has already happened. That miracle is that God gave us Jesus, that the grave is defeated and does not have the last word. This is the gift offered to us freely for the taking, and we rest in that. We were reminded that God has always been and always will be faithful. The why question was not answered for us. But this was a beautiful reminder that while the pain was very real and present, it does not change who God is. Our aim in calling out to God and asking for deliverance is not simply to meet our needs, but the point is to rely on who God is. Shortly following my dad's death, my mother-in-law was awaiting test results as she battles breast cancer. In fact, it was the weekend of my dad's funeral, and I remember my wife reminding me, my mom will be getting her most recent test results back soon, and sitting in the reality of loss with cancer still in our midst, felt like an absolute punch to the gut. The pain of life piling on. There was no relief in that moment. 
Instead, we lamented the seemingly relentless nature of the brokenness of pain, the brokenness and pain of life happening all around us. How long? We don't deny the pain. We don't move past the grief. Rather, we cry out to God because we are not okay. And we do so trusting in the promise of what already is. We cling to what's true of God in the midst of pain and grief. This is the model of lament. We are invited to lament. We see the model for lament. Lastly, I want us to see the reality of worship in lament. Worship in lament. It seems to me that American Christianity places a high value on emotion. If you're going to worship God, you've got to feel it, right? And the emotions that count in worship are the happy and cheerful ones. But church, the Bible gives us a much deeper view of worship. Sure, there are times when we're exuberant and joyful and happy in the presence of God, and we should not discredit that. But Psalm 22 also shows us what we might call willful worship. What I mean by that is we choose to worship the Lord in all of our limited ways because we know what's true of him. We see this shift toward worship in verse 22, where the psalm moves from a prayer for seeking his help to a praise for his help. Verse 22 says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. After a cry for deliverance, the mood changes, and we see a declaration of the name of the Lord. His praise addresses the Lord, and he is calling us to acknowledge and reckon with who the Lord is. He is Yahweh, the eternal covenant Lord of Israel. Earlier in Psalm 22, David looked back acknowledging, Our fathers trusted in you, and you delivered them. Even when my circumstances are sad, I can look back in remembrance and celebrate what is true of God and what he has done for his people. And because of what God has done in the past, we have confidence of what he will do in the future. Look at verse 26. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Sin entered the world in Genesis 3, and with it, pain, brokenness, suffering. But verse 26 reminds us that it's not the way it's meant to be. It shows us the afflicted will be vindicated. Praising the name of the Lord will be the result. Author Jen Michael says this, when Christians lament, they also rehearse a story. The story of God's breakable body and the power that put it back together again. That story of death and resurrection belongs in the same book as Israel's stories of Exodus and Passover of tabernacle and temple, of priest and prophet and king. This story of God's broken body is one of continuity and discontinuity, continuation and beginning. It is a story of death, but also a story of God's victory over all that is lamentable. If God's body broke, the resurrection stakes this bold claim, lament will have no last word. Brokenness is a middle act, not the final scene. We may not get the answers we deserve. This, there's loss we will never recover on this side of eternity. God lamented and suffered, and he does not remain indifferent. 
He reigns on his throne, having defeated death. And so we cry out. And in our lament, we worship because of the promise of life and restoration to come through our Lord. This is the call to worship and lament. Psalm 22 shows us the invitation to lament, the model of lament, and worship in lament. Listen, if there's one thing this year has taught us, it's this. There is no guaranteed normal, right? We don't know what's coming tomorrow that might unsettle us. We don't know what will happen personally or globally next week that, quite frankly, you and I have no control over. We're not safe. We're not okay. We don't know what's coming, but here's what we do know. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is the down payment of God's promise that he is making all things new so we can worship him now even as we lament. When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out fully knowing he was not going to be relieved of the extraordinary physical pain and the deep spiritual agony. Jesus was worshiping in and through lament. Lament is a form of worship. As some of the others who preached in recent weeks have said, the Psalms just come alive in a different way when we see them on the lips of Jesus. And so as we close this morning, listen to this excerpt from Dane Ortland regarding Jesus' expression of Psalm 22. He says, while Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was originally written in Hebrew, Jesus spoke it in Aramaic and thus was personally appropriating it. Jesus wasn't simply repeating David's experience of a thousand years earlier as a convenient parallel expression. Rather, every anguished Psalm 22-1 cry across the millennia was being recapitulated and fulfilled and deepened in Jesus. His was the true Psalm 22.1, of which ours are the shadows. As the people of God, all our feelings of forsakenness funneled through an actual human heart, and a single moment of anguished horror on Calvary, an actual forsakenness. Who could possibly bear up beneath it? Who would not cry out and shut down? When communion with God had been one's oxygen, one's meat and drink throughout his whole life, without a single moment of interruption by sin, to suddenly bear the unspeakable weight of all of our sins, who could survive that? To lose that depth of communion was to die. The great love at the heart of the universe was being rent in two. The world's light was going out, and inventing that righteous wrath, God was not striking a morally neutral tree. He was splintering the lovely one so that we ugly ones could be freely beautified, pardoned, calmed. Our heaven through his hell. Our entrance into love through his loss of it. You and I are invited to cry out to God because he is a holy and trustworthy God. It's exactly where we're called to be. Let's look to him and let's worship this God in light of all of our pain and grief. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning trusting that you are a good and faithful God. You are not indifferent to who we are or the troubles that we might face, but you know us and you identify with us. Help us in all our limited ways to come to you in the midst of hurt and pain, 
not ignoring it, not denying it, but standing in the hopeful promise that you will make all things new. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we have now is an opportunity to take all these beautiful truths of the good news of the gospel in the midst of suffering and to make them deeply personal as we come to communion. Because here's the deal. In communion, we have this proclamation of the gospel that God did not despise our suffering. He did not stand far off. In fact, Jesus got deep into our suffering with us. In the bread, we see his body given to us on the cross. In the wine, we see his blood spilled out for the forgiveness of our sin. He did not despise our suffering. But he didn't just do that in some general, far-off way just for everybody in general. No, he did it for you, for each one of you in particular. So as you get to come and receive a piece of bread in your physical hand, as you get to take the wine and, or the juice and taste it on your lips, know that Jesus did not despise your suffering. He died so he could be in your particular circumstances, in your particular suffering with you today. So as the servers get ready and put on their gloves and get ready to serve, would you take an opportunity just to bow your head to consider where am I suffering right now? Where do I need to invite Jesus into my suffering? Where do I need to hear the good news that he is in it with me? Take a moment to do that. Talk to God about it. And as you come and you receive communion, know that Jesus is there with you in it. Worship him. Celebrate that. Listen, we always say if you are not a Christian yet, if you haven't trusted Jesus, we ask that you would just refrain from this meal because we don't wanna, want you to participate in something or pretend something's real that's not for you yet. So perfectly glad for you to be where you are. Instead, consider what would it mean to, to trust Jesus fully, to have him in life with you so much so that he shares your suffering. How we practice communion here at Coram Deo is that we will exit to the left of our rows one at a time from front to back, come up, a server will place a piece of bread in your hand. You can receive it, grab either a juice or a wine, and then take that back to your seat or uh, enjoy the elements there. There's a place for you to uh, throw out your cup when you're finished. Um, take a moment, come, and celebrate uh, the good news that Jesus is with us in our suffering. There are things I long to know, places that I want to go, but I don't think I'll ever leave this place. What is it that I have to show? For myself I haven't grown. It's hard to see much changing at this place. Even in the hardest parts of life In the midst of suffering If I could even find the words to pray I would Jesus, I know You are good, I know And even when I don't Even still it is so Father, I let go of my need to know You are good, you are just, and I give you my trust The one I love is feeling pain Will they ever be the same? I don't think what I'm asking is to Looking for someone to play At times I've even cursed your name But in my heart and hearts I've known your touch Jesus 
Jesus, I know you are good. I know, and even when I don't, even still it is so. The Father, I let go of my need to know you are good, you are just, and I give you my trust. Everyone else seems to say, trust in God, He knows the way. Platitudes that add to my distress. Considering what I've been told, bitterness is taking hold. I can't help it, I have been let down. Even in the hardest parts of life In the midst of suffering If I could even find the words to pray I would Jesus, I know You are good I know And even when I don't Even still it is so Father, I Just and I give you my trust. It doesn't feel the way it should. I know that it couldn't be so good if only you would take this cup from me. Longing for things to be new, I lift my eyes, I look for you. Are you present? It's so hard to see Even in the hardest parts of life In the midst of suffering If I could even find the words to pray I would but Jesus, I know You are good I know And even when I don't even still it is so the father i let go of my need to know you are good you are just and i give you my trust because you are good you are just and i give you my trust Would you stand with us as we sing this last song? Against me you have turned your hand My body wastes away Darkness you have made me dwell Like one already dead To you I cry for help And you are silent still You block my prayers, you shut me out My soul is weary
against us you have spent your hour we have no strength to stand your enemies reject its harm consume suffering your pain that took a lot and it, it meant a lot and it reminded us of the gospel so thank you now we get to go out in the hope that our suffering is not the end of the story right jesus is going to come back and make all things new so we go on that hope even in the midst of suffering receive this benediction and now may the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship and communion of the holy spirit abide and remain with us now and throughout our time on earth until the day of his return amen Go in peace.